This webinar is all about work-life balance. So today we have, you know, the four of us, which I feel like I tried to ask four people that have completely different lives, right? <laughs> and to kind of talk about work-life balance here. So first, uh, introductions. I want to introduce Sam Nielsen, a school is an instructor, concept artist, character designer, everything, artist extraordinaire, works in games and, and uh, animated movies and things like that. Then we have Carlo Ortiz, another extremely awesome artist, another one of my artistic heroes. Uh, Carla works in all sorts of things. For some reason, the first thing that came to mind is actually Magic the Gathering, because like I've been looking at your Magic the Gathering stuff recently and just going, <laughs> just mind boggling, just mind boggling. But also Marvel. Anybody heard of Marvel Studios, Marvel movies? Last but definitely not least, nine time Emmy winning uh, studio owner, CEO, badass extraordinaire. Maureen Fan, of CEO of Baobab Studios. So welcome, Maureen. Thank you. Fantastic. And so uh, today, it's all about work-life balance. One thing we could just start off with real simply is, when do you usually get up? <laughs> Who wants to start that one? <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to think, is there even a usually... It's like every all, day all wildly place. different. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay, I'm. I'll, I'll. I'll jump. I'm a night owl, so like, and I've tried to do seven, six. I can only get it when I'm like traveling across, you know, from one continent to another, and I have jet lag. But normally, I wake up anywhere between nine to like ten, <laughs> sometimes even eleven if I go. If I have like a paint night where I'm just like binging and it's like 3 a.m., 5 a.m., yeah, <laughs> I'm definitely a night owl. Wow, 5 a.m. and you still get up at around 9 or 10. My That's yeah. not that much sleep. <laughs> no, I have bags under my eyes because I just finished a lot of work for the <laughs> holidays. So I'm just like. <laughs> not really, not really. Oh, Usually I, I wear it. glasses to I hide my bags a little Ooh, bit more, fancy. which reminded me I should probably put them on. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, I, um, my brain, I, I have like a certain rule where I can't paint past like 9 p.m. unless I'm ready to paint until like 3 or 4 a.m. because my brain just kicks on and it takes forever for it to calm down. Um, and then I just wake up. But, but it's very rare that I usually try to aim for seven to eight hours of sleep. Otherwise, I'm just useless. And while, uh, while Sam figures out when does he get up usually, why don't we go to Maureen? I wake up the same time every morning because I have kids and they wake me up so I don't get to decide. So it's um, between 6.30 and 7 a.m. Because nice. I got to do the like, breastfeeding thing. Uh, <laughs> and then, yeah. So it's very, and then waking up in the middle of the night for the middle of the night pumping milk session <laughs> so always at midnight <laughs> yes. so you got the natural alarms yeah. uh, <laughs> what about sam yeah I, so i have kids also and they're uh uh so th there's a pretty consistent like it's somewhere between like 6 a.m and like 9 <laughs> This is when I wake up because at some point there, I'm, I think I'm better at sleeping through the kids and I don't have to breastfeed. So it's like I, I can make it through uh, sometimes some kid loudness, but eventually they get to me. But um, like Carla, it's like, you know, it's like when they, I, I can't really work that effectively. And I also have, a, a, I'm a university professor at BYU. And, and like, so a lot of my day hours are, are soaked up. And so when I'm working, when I'm doing my uh, project work, it's all in the evenings. Um, and so, yeah, I'm often, you know, midnight, 1 p.m. is probably about as late as I get to bed. So, so I try to sleep as much as I can, but it, it does get kind of defined more by the kids than anything else. I, I get up around 4.30, 5 o'clock. There what? we go. Huh? I have, what? you know, honestly, it's not on purpose. Uh, a lot of times it's just <laughs> been, I'm a, I'm a creature of habit and that's the yeah. habit I, I really love. Okay, but when do you go to sleep then? <laughs> that 
you know, is it fluctuates. A lot of times I end up like just waking up on the couch and going, what? When did that happen? Bobby. So it doesn't affect you? It, the, the fact that you stay up later doesn't affect you. You just wake up at four or five no matter what. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't. It doesn't. I just Damn. get up. Damn. But you need the five hours, I think, minimum, right, for the REM sleep, for your yeah. body to do its... I was just thinking about that the other day, like, mm. um, uh, but I get, I don't know, I get pretty good sleep. I, I, <laughs> I practice trying to figure out how to get to sleep, you know, faster and faster. Do I don't know if you guys do that. Do you take naps? sometimes sometimes but generally i am just like pumped to be alive you know <laughs> yeah. what i mean and that's that's good for me. It, it can be pumped to be alive while you take a nap <laughs> <laughs> true, true true i i'm a big i love naps so it doesn't matter like i can nap but i'm a good like 10 to 15 minute napper like anything more than that i like it screws me up but like i just like take a nap and I have a, an adorable cat she knows when it's nap time and she'll just lay on me and it's like okay it's our cat nap literally with a cat nap it's time like one of those know? weighted blankets yeah like I don't like need a weighted dirty. blanket nice. but she's yeah. like six pounds so it's not very like weighted <laughs> she's tiny so nap. I have to be careful with naps it's like if I lay down even thinking like eh, maybe just a second to to you know get a rest it's like five hours later just wake up it's like what the heck happened <laughs> so i have to be really careful with it because my day times are i can't i can't sacrifice five hours and so and they, it just disappears it's like a in a but movie they this just, is like, also time. how i get to sleep so easily and this might help some people is like you get into these rituals you know always do the same things before you go to sleep Right. And that way, I, I think subconsciously, your body will also know, OK, yeah, it's getting to nap time or whatever. You're about to go to sleep. And so if I have trouble sleeping, first thing is I don't think about the present or the past. I try to really or sorry, the future or the past. You try to stay in the present. Right. And I, I generally I'll try to just be aware of the space in between my eyes. And I just focus on that um, and and. Uh, think about the breathing in and breathing out and try to do 10 long ones. And by the time that's done, you're pretty good. And the other thing I have is a really boring book beside my bed. <laughs> and that helps too. That's good. I, I think out of all the issues, like sleeping is, is the one I, I struggle with a lot just because I go through periods of like where I sleep really well. And then out of nowhere, I get insomnia because I get really hyped up about an idea. It's oh. usually about painting. Like it's so stupid. I can just be like, all right, no brain like tomorrow. But the brain's just like, Hey, Hey, listen, what about this idea? You're like, calm down, I'm trying to sleep. And, and so that, that sometimes does affect me, but that's why like the way that, you know, I work from home. And so I don't have to be anywhere in particular at a specific time. So it does help, you know, it does work for me for those small periods of time throughout the year where I just get random bouts of insomnia. Well, now that we've covered sleep, uh, let's take on some questions. First one is coming from Ray. Ray, I am giving you the mic. Uh, what's your question? Hey, everyone. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Hi, Ray. Hi, thank you so much for this panel. Uh, I wanted to ask, um, how do you go about finding hobbies that aren't art related? Because for me, I always, even when I'm reading a book, I'm thinking, oh, how can I draw this character? How can I turn this into a good storyboard? Or when I'm watching a movie, I'm like, oh, this part of this could be better by this. How do you like go away from that mindset? Mm, I don't even know if I do. I always try to connect them. <laughs> That's fair, but like, I feel like I get no rest, if that makes sense. Like, I'm always thinking about how to make something. Yeah. I, um, I, I like to do, I like to do very, mm. very things away from my art, just because like, it's very easy to live and breathe it. You know, you're just like, you're working you know, your nine to five uh, hours of it, and then you're trying to do your own personal work. And that can very easily take over 
um, me, I found it like when I'm at that state, like, and I don't leave room for other things in my life, I get like burnt out really easily and I don't give my best. So like for me, it, it, it changes drastically uh, every year, but like I use like, for example, cooking. It's a, it's a thing I really love to do. Um, the pandemic kind of took it away because I love to cook for lots of people. Um, but I'm, I, you know, Thanksgiving helped me bring it back. So now I'm like, I'm going to cook soups, especially it's so cold. Um, video games. I don't get feel guilty for playing video games. It's how I like relax. It makes me feel like, you know, especially like story-based video games. I really adore them. Um, reading is fantastic. Taking walks is one of my favorite things. I try to take a walk, um, you know, when I wake up in the mornings at nine, <laughs> I, I get started at work around like 10 or 11 and sometimes 12, depending on, but then I work throughout the entire night. So it's fine. But like, so I try to find things that I feel like I, and, and sometimes I think the trick to all of this is like, you know, how do you even know what you need? Cause it took me a really long time to figure that out. And it's just like by trying out different things and saying, oh, do I enjoy this? Oh, is this nice? Um, and then just trying to consistently prioritize that part of yourself because it will bring you, um, because it, it doesn't help your creativity. Like it, your mind will always connect it back to painting, whether you want it or not. I don't know if there's like a solid stop button to that, but yeah. Yeah, I, 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 I think... With Bo like with what Bobby said, I'm just like really I, I like to connect things and I want everything to be connected, but I also recognize what Carla's saying that like you need it's like you just need that that's something different. And so um, I have one day a week every week where it's just like I deliberately try to avoid anything work related, anything that I, is even like a usual rot routine for every day, and just like that one day is just like totally like I I it's off limits right, and it's really uh, nice because then like boredom is this awesome source of kind of hobby making and, and other things and reading books that you wouldn't do and going on walks that you wouldn't normally take and stuff like that. So, um, mm -hmm. yeah, that's, that's how I do it. It's just kind of like one day every week, just, I need that, that rest, that break. Uh, yeah. You know, I think what I do is because I, I meditate and I meditate daily and like I meditate pretty much go to sleep and getting up and all sorts of things. I, I feel like the rest of the time, it's okay to connect everything, you know, cause I have that, I guess that's my thing, meditation mm -hmm. to disconnect. How, Marine, how, did you you get good? how did you get good at meditation? I can't like, I used to be good when, before I was an entrepreneur and now the ta thoughts just attacking my head. At all yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, same. I'm not, naturally i'm definitely not the best at meditation but i found that um guided meditations helped mm -hmm. me to get into regular meditations that are unguided you know guided meditations a lot of times they'll give you little reminders like it knows you're about to drift off into another focus and and you're starting to think about work now and it'll tell you all right why don't you come back and you know if there's thoughts in your head that's okay <laughs> let's get rid of them and that kind of thing headspace is a good one headspace. that one's simple it's really good that's a very popular one <laughs> i think like on this and, and maureen if you want to add on or say anything i don't want to speak over oh, you either cool. I know. <laughs> but i think like my the favorite my favorite quote on this uh is actually from ian mckeg he was like i asked him once for a quote on this stuff and he's like rich lives lead, lead to rich imaginations. And I think like, you know, whether it's things that you do personally um, or with other people, I think it is important to take a moment um, and kind of recharge yourself. And, and that varies uh, depending on who you are. Like for some people, it will be like, hey, I want to go out and hang out with my friends. For some people, it's I want to go hang out with my friends and read books with them, you know, like, or I want to like take walks. I want to like meditate and be a Zen master over there, you know. Like, <laughs> uh, so, so yeah, I think, I think it's a, it's a tricky question to answer because it differs from person to person, but it's, it's important to, to, to have it as like, you know, kind of keep it in mind that, that if you're feeling really burnt out, maybe it's time to take a little time for yourself. Yeah. I, I found it helpful to practice being bored. 
because you know, we're never bored anymore. We have our phones with us all the time. And to be pr- like, to be bored is kind of like to let everything drain out, out of your head, you know, and that can help a lot of times. It, I think the number one thing that everybody's kind of feeling, if they're feeling anything kind of negative is like a feeling of being overwhelmed, right? With everything that's going on in the world and in, in everybody's lives. Um, why don't we go back and forth and go to one of the written questions yeah. here. So this one is from Aisha. How do you deal with guilt for wanting to relax and not paint and draw uh, with, but with thoughts that tell you you should be painting instead of relaxing or spending time in other important life activities? This is such a good one. Um, I don't know if you guys are a fan of lists, but I'm a big fan of lists. And my list, there's an ending point where it's like, you're done today. You know, you're good. Um, does anybody want to speak about Aisha's question? I, I have a friend, um, Kelly Loosely, who um, <clears throat> he always says that if you, the animation is the illusion of life. And if you don't have a life, you can't create animation. And I think like anytime that you feel that sense of guilt, like just remind yourself of that saying, like animation is the illusion of life. And if you don't have a life, you can't create animation. And I, that, that's been really helpful for me to kind of think about that. Yeah, I would, I would say, and by the way, Bobby, we do need to talk some, about Liz because I'm a big bullet journal fan now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm all about lists and, and that, but, but what I wanted to say, um, it's just like, also remind yourself, you're not a machine. If you're drawing consistently all the time, you're going to hurt yourself. Like your arms are going to hurt. You're going to develop, like I, I, I have like RSI. And if I work too much, my hands remind me. So if it's not only for your mental well-being, but it's also for your physical well-being. And it's part of t- that rest is also part of the creative process. It's, it's just as important as when you're like actively painting. So, so whenever you hear that, like understand that, like, you know, it's, 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 you know, change, change your perspective on it. It, it will help you a lot. Sometimes, you know, owners of companies, there is no off switch. Is there an off switch for Maureen fan? Yeah, I love baking. So I love, <laughs> I'm also pre-diabetic. And so baking is torture, but it's like the way I get to be around sugar, though I can't eat the output, but I get to smell it. It's just very messed up. But the other thing is because I'm pre-diabetic, I have to walk after every single meal. And that's actually great time because that's my meditation. Um, and it's my time just for myself. And especially when, so I'm not an artist because I'm the business person, but I do believe as an artist, you need to, um, in order for you to have your individuality, you need to have your alone time too. Like as a mom, you know, when you're thinking about your kids, your family, doing everything for everybody else, except for yourself, you're going to lose like what makes you like but who's I, your core. I just want to. Uh, ask Maureen because you know being an owner you have well many of us we have this like guilt on us like are you doing enough for your company right and yeah so yeah everything's your that? fault at the what end of the day anything of that happens that's bad is your fault <laughs> so like <laughs> like even if like an employee is like not doing a good job that's your fault for hiring that employee or for not like catching it or helping them or like everything's your fault so there's a lot of pressure and so you are thinking about it constantly even when you're not working and there's always infinite amounts to do but I think now like this is my sixth year of doing it I think in the beginning I was just crazy and I never slept and by now I just see that when I'm totally wiped out I'm if as an owner you're supposed to be this like light from which people take energy from (laughs) and if you're not shining bright then um the whole company is going to be muted because they can sense that and you as a leader need to be you know excited about what you're doing to to impart that upon uh, those who are working with you so i find that if i don't keep myself 
and I could like I've tried in the past to pretend like when I'm really tired and drained and still pretend, but it's not authentic and people can tell. So I've now decided I have to have to find ways to to do this. Also, it was affecting my health. Like part of my pre-diabetes is directly when I wake up into my finger prick, it's directly proportional to how much sleep I've gotten and how much stress I have. So it's like directly impacts my health. So I've had to force myself to do these things. But yeah, it's really hard because it's a lot of pressure. <laughs> you are you thinking know, about it. Something that I'm a huge advocate of uh, that some people know about is Wim Hof. I don't know if you guys <laughs> know about the Wim Hof method, but this guy, he has like I don't know, nine, 20 different uh, world records. He does this practice where you do this breathing exercise and then take a nice cold shower. I know you're not, maybe, you know, you might not be a fan of an ice cold shower, uh, but if you just do the breathing exercise, if you prick yourself before and then after the breathing exercise, you'll see a dramatic difference in your blood sugar. And the only thing that you did differently was the breathing exercise. So... Hmm. If you want another thing to do, you could do that. And yeah. that, that could help. The other thing, I don't know if you, because uh, Jamie is the most amazing ever, um, but for Danica, um, she's our operations manager um, at our company. I have her block off times on my calendar where I am not to be disturbed <laughs> during this time. So it like, forces me to spend that time like catching up on email or doing whatever. So uh, like you have to force yourself to do it. Mm -hmm. But maybe I, I should think, do the Wim Hof thing during that time. That, that's an important note. And especially like with the kind of pandemic and uh, now that everything's like connected and you're always on and people can contact you at any time. It's so important to be able to kind of like just shut it all down. You know, if, if you have to get somebody to schedule it for you or take your iPad away or whatever it is that you need to do. <clears throat> now, we have a lot of people with hands up. So I'm going to go to Jesse. Jesse Draper, you have the mic. Hi, guys. A big fan of all of your work. What an incredible panel. Uh, I had the great opportunity of studying with Sam at BYU, and I was always impressed that he was able to have kind of a nine to five teaching job, but then do all of these freelance projects. And now that I work my own nine to five art adjacent job and I have freelance projects, I'm really, because they come in so randomly, how do you schedule the time? How do you like focus on that second part? from your normal thing and do an Excel in that. Cause I, I see you all excelling in that. Yeah, I, I guess I can talk to that since you, you brought my name up. Uh, I think, well, first of all, luckily my, my job isn't nine to five and I have a lot of flexibility about how I use that time. And that that's been essential. Um, but I think even back when I was working for Disney and I did have nine to five and I was doing freelance, I, I think one of the things that has helped me the most is uh, the, so somebody back in the day drew me, it's like a four quadrant thing and you've probably seen it before. It's like, you know, the way that you prioritize tasks, there's like urgent, important, urgent, not important, not urgent, not important, and uh, important, not urgent right and uh, the things to pay attention to of course are the the important quadrants and even the stuff that's important and not urgent like that's the stuff that needs priority i've found that like that's kind of the secret to everything for me is for, and like if i were to say like what's what's the primary thing that allows me to have a good work life balance is priority and for me the priority is first and foremost my family and it's because i've been around the block enough times to realize that like a successful career it's definitely worth you know an, an art animation career definitely worth going for because like otherwise what do you have accountancy or something like you know it, it's awesome but it's not the source of happiness and so i think for me it's like my family it's like i i carve out the time it's not a ton of time but it's like that time is sacred and i make sure that that doesn't get um, encroached on by anything and what's interesting is um you've probably all heard the the lesson or the, the story of like the rocks in the you know you have like the sand and the pebbles and the big rocks and you know which ones go into the bottle first right it when you know what those priorities are and you put the big rocks in the bottle first like the pebbles in the sand they just fit and you don't you almost don't have to worry about it it's it's kind of uncanny <laughs> and i i think like that's the best advice that i've got is just like find the thing that's really important to you carve it out make sure there's time for it 
and everything else kind of falls into place. And you might be surprised at how many things you've been spending time on that you didn't need to spend time on. That were small pebbles that you were you were filling your bottle up with these small pebbles and you didn't need to. And and I think that's where priority is kind of the, where the magic is in answering this question, Jesse. Yeah, I'm, I'm not very good with uh, spring cleaning, but I'm good with like spring cleaning for your priorities. <laughs> right. And like every year, at least once or twice a year, I'd write down, what the hell am I doing every day? You know, what are all of my priorities and I'll list down a giant bunch and with every single one, look at it and go, can I make this easier? Can I eliminate this? And just by doing that or saying, if I had to, you know, which ones do I eliminate? You know, if I had to eliminate X amount, that seems to uh, kind of refocus my perspective on things because a lot of times when you're in the mix, you're just in the mix, right? You're just tumbling through life and, and you don't really realize, oh, I actually don't need to do that thing anymore. This is all really, really excellent advice. So I don't, I don't know if there's much to add. Um, I also do, um, I have a very, you know, I didn't use to, but this really helped change my life like have a system where like, again, I'm like the bullet journal person here <laughs> where like, you know, I write down all my tasks and exactly it, it allows you to examine what is truly important, what can be left for another moment, what can, you know, what do you need to do right away? And it kind of forces you to, yes, to, as, as Bobby and Sam were mentioning, just kind of like acknowledge what is truly a priority versus what not. But for me, um, on a more practical matter, um, when I am at my busiest, yes, I am working like my nine to five and I am working like some freelance projects, but I'm extremely picky now with my freelance projects. Like, you know, because my time is so valuable, like I have to ask myself, is this something I really want to work on? Because, you know, if you already have a nine to five, that's where, you know, that's where you're getting your money. If that can satisfy your material needs, then the rest of your free time is for you. So like you could spend it on a freelance project for someone if you're really passionate about that project, or you could spend it creating your own stories. You could spend it taking walks. You could spend it with your family. You could spend, you know, it's, it's really, time is really valuable. Um, but what I like to do when I find, don't find myself with energy to do the freelance at the end of the day is I kind of do a little bit of a ritual where I kind of do little things to kind of get me in the mindset to paint. Like, um, you know, I, sometimes it's either tea or depending on the day, wine, you know, kind of start putting on my favorite tracks and dive in. And, and even just like that little pre-ritual it's kind of like signaling your mind, okay, it's time to shift from, you know, eating, you know, being with friends, you know, end of the day type of situation to now doing the side work, but, but take the side work very, you know, try to limit it because it can very quickly overwhelm your entire life if you're not careful. Maureen, how do you Maureen, turn off the, uh, yeah, turn the work the meter? Um, Turning off is um, when I look into my child's face, it turns everything off automatically <laughs> because I- Oh, that's so nice. Joy from looking. I, it's actually kind of, I feel guilty because I actually use that as a way to, to de-stress. <laughs> Just look at her face and then everything else goes away. Um, that's <laughs> what I do. But in terms of prioritization, I actually, at the beginning of the week, sit down and prioritize every single meeting I have into must-haves and nice to haves and I actually stack rank them and then have my assistant actually <laughs> get rid of things. And when something pops in, the other thing goes away. Um, so I'm very meticulous and, and uh, aggro about that to make sure. But it, I think it's also really helpful between husband and wife, by the way, to very clearly mark out the things that you, um, uh, who does what. <laughs> and then yeah. if this happens, who's the one that's gonna do it to avoid fights. This is what my life coach um, had me and, and my husband do. Oh, I did. I, I, cool. Yes. Yeah, so she's like, I never got pissy. She's like, you guys should just like write it out and make it clear because otherwise there's things instead. Like I hate washing dishes. So <laughs> wash the dishes. I did notice in the Q&A section that 
two people had the same question, both Joe Wong and also Claudia Lepe Lepage, or Lepage <laughs> about how do you find time to learn um, ah. when you have a full-time job? For me, uh, people that you know, the, the people at the studio that have access to my calendar, they can see that Friday, it, it says no appointments every Friday, you know, and, and in the beginning, it was tough. But once people get used to it, then it's great, you know, and that's my day for learning as well as mornings. But then I don't, I don't have kids. So I feel like I have an advantage, you know. Um. For me, it's so, so there's, it's twofold. Like for me, I always try and find ways in which I can reasonably learn something in my job. And when I mean reasonably, I mean, I'm not going to go on the deep end and be all exploratory because I don't know what the result is going to be. But like, you know, like, let's say I'm painting something that has water or I'm painting something that you know, has something that I don't usually tackle, I try to take that as study time. Like, oh, I'm going to study how this works and see how to best improve it so that I'm maximizing my time um, while I'm working. Outside of work, um, it really just depends. It's, it, it has a lot to do with what we were talking about earlier about prioritizing. Um, and it's like saving out time that says, yes, I will, you know, take a course every week and this is where I go. And that's the commitment you make. And, and sometimes making such grand commitments to yourself and, you know, sticking through it, like you'll find yourself adjusting your schedule to best fit that. Like, you'll be like, oh no, like I can't like, for example, go on, you know, out on Mondays or something. Cause that's when I have a class. I, I need to be there. And and I think that's helpful, but I think it's just like putting your foot down and private saying, okay, what is reasonable? Like what, what, what's, what's my time looking like? What is reasonable and how can I like commit to learning something new within that time? I, I want to second what Carla said about just like how many opportunities there are for learning just kind of built into your artistic journey, right? You, you want to learn about, uh, you know, it's like this week I was studying bird feathers because I had to draw a bird and I was trying to understand like how this thing and I like went, you know, it wasn't just like, look at like, what what do they look like? But actually like going into the Wikipedia and chasing down the links and trying to actually understand how this whole process works. And um, I think like there, it, it'll make you a better artist and it will just make you a more educated person if you just kind of use your research opportunities to do more than just get reference pictures, but actually to understand the things that you're, you're drawing, painting, whatever. Um, and the those become awesome learning opportunities. But I, I also want to say that um, studies are really important. It's so important to do studies. If, if you want to get better, I mean, you can watch uh, 100,000 YouTube videos and not get any better. It's, I mean, I've, I've seen this happen for myself. I'll, I'll watch a bunch of stuff and I'll be all inspired and then I won't do anything about it. And then like, you know, two weeks later, I'm this exact same artist and I'm just like, what happened? None of that stuff made a difference. And it's just like, you got to do the studies. You got to actually go down and start to create the work. And so like go out gesture drawing, do mm -hmm. uh, little color comps, make sure you're um, studying your anatomy, whatever. It's like, it, it's, you don't even have to spend that much time on it, right? It could be 15 minutes a day that you just sit down and say, okay, this is my study time. And you'll mm -hmm. learn lots faster if you do that. When I was working at Kabam a long, long time ago. I, um, me and the whole art team had something called our lunchies and they were 15 minute lunch studies, lunch studies, lunchies. And like the entire art team would just sit by and we time ourselves and just do like a study of a film, film screen cap. And we all collectively learned so much, you know, just doing those, you know, like studies. So yeah, as, as Sam said, it doesn't have to be grand. I think it's more consistency over time that is more helpful. Yeah, I got one that's super simple uh, that I do. You know, I didn't even think about it because it's so kind of natural. Just make the things that you want to learn very accessible to you. That's what I do when I take a break from my work is like, I, I have a, I'm going to give a big plug to, you know, schoolism because I always have a schoolism course open. Uh, and if I don't, I have a schoolism workout open, you know, and then I have the file open as well amongst my, you know, uh, freelance work. And so 
any time where you get frustrated or you feel yourself slowing down with um, whatever assignment, I switch over to schoolism. I watch the video, I do the assignment a bit, and then I come back and I look at the thing with fresh eyes and with a little bit of new input as well, new information, right? Um, and that's how I, I've been able to consistently do learning uh, no matter you know, what my schedule looks like. Everybody needs breaks. That was such good advice that I'm writing it down right now. <laughs> Thanks, Bobby. <laughs> good advice. Why don't we go on to another uh, question? Because we have so many people asking questions. <laughs> oh, Duke, I, I'm not sure if I pronounced that right, but you have the mic. So you can tell me Hi. I pronounced it wrong. <laughs> no, it's okay. It's uh, an abbreviation of my name. I'm Manuela. Um, and I actually was on Lightbox Expo this year online. Oh, and fantastic. I was on one of Carla's panels, which were, hey. you were talking a little bit about this. And I mean, it wasn't only delightful because your bubbly personality is fantastic. <laughs> but you said something that impacted me a lot. And actually, I, I spoke about it with my classmates. I studied illustration in Toronto. And they were, it was suddenly like something kind of a realization. <laughs> and I, I'm pretty sure you were the one who said that. And it's that you don't give your 100% on every word. <laughs> you give like a 60, 70% and like that you have room to not burn out and also just to, to be able to give more whenever you're asked to give more and that for us was like oh my god I don't have to like give everything of myself every time and I want and I, and I wonder if you could you know talk a lot of a little bit about that because really my classmates their their eyes just pop out when I told them that so, so I had a chat thank you by the way for all the kind words um I had a chat recently with a student and I told him that and he's like oh so I can phone it in I'm like no 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 you're not phoning it in no no you're still delivering quality work but when I started um at my first job at NCSoft you know I would go in and I just like kill myself did these like crazy hours and just like showcase all the quantity all the quality to the point where I was like going really really hard like I would stay like at my job like every day at nine and then I had to commute for two hours and it was just like so my my lead uh Carolina Tello who's fantastic she came one day and she's like listen Carla you're giving this 100% and I'm just beaming I'm like yes I am and she's like I need you to give me 70% of that. And I'm like, do you want less? What do you, what? You know, it was kind of shocking. She's like, number one, you're working yourself to a pulp and everybody will now expect you to work at a hundred percent every single time. So when, the, you know, things get really rough and you, they ask you to work even harder, you can't because you've already met your limit. So if you do it at about like 70% and 70, you know, let's let's make it a little higher just so that people don't think they have to put it in let's do 75 if you do it 75 percent you're still delivering good quality because you're not going to deliver crappy stuff either but you're not you're taking your time you're doing it little by little you're not you know going crazy trying to push your limits every single time and it's a thing about sustainability rather than you know you know because especially when people are starting out, they're really, really excited and they want to just like showcase what they can do and be brilliant and bright and just like, oh, look at what I can do. And that's wonderful, but you can't sustain that. So you find a level that is suitable for you, that gives you, that gives your work a lot of energy, that gives your work a lot of quality, but doesn't burn you out. So just want to add a caveat. It's not, it's not a call to phone it in either. <laughs> no, I would, I would love to give a little, a little thing in there as well, because I know you, Carla, and I know like people like us have that personality where we can totally work ourselves to the bone yes. and, and totally love it the whole entire time until the very end, Yeah, you know, kind of thing. Uh, not all of us are like that. And there's plenty of people that actually, they don't give enough. 
So also think about yourself. And if you are not too sure about how you are, think about the closest people and what they think of you <laughs> maybe, and then you'll get a better grasp of you if you should turn it up or dial it down. Yeah. <laughs> I, I want to just add some because I think that's fantastic advice. And I think there, there might be different personalities out there. Um, and so I just want to like throw out maybe an alternative way of thinking about this, which is um, that you want to be intense in your work ethic, but really laid back emotionally, right? Oh. It's like your, your emotions are just like, you know, cool. Yeah, whatever happens. And that'll actually serve you really well professionally when the director, you know, calls you out for something you're screwing up or whatever, you know, it's like, there's all sorts of professional situations where that's going to help you to be really laid back emotionally and not have everything riding on the line for this moment. But it's like when you're working, you're working and you're putting everything you got into it and then you clock out and you're done and your emotions are you're just like, yeah, it's fine. And you move on to the next thing. <laughs> To add even more to that, like, so when I was younger, and I talk about this often in workshops, but when I was younger, like, I was so emotionally attached to my artwork that, like, the sense of failing or the sense of not getting what I wanted or what I was envisioning was so detrimental to me that, like, I literally quit, quit art, like, when I was much, much younger in my early 20s. And it wasn't until I started detaching myself emotionally from, you know, the the final or, or or the painting itself like i didn't see art or what i paint as a barometer of my value as a human so like you kind of just cut that through and then you can take a step back and see it in ways that it's like oh it's it's like a puzzle it's strategic i i can think about this without the fear of failure so so you have really good advice Dan. damn <laughs> everybody here so good. i'd love to add uh a little story that I feel relates to this. It recently, I think it's just like two days ago, I heard the story about the first race to Antarctica, right? A lot of people may have heard of this, like uh, the first people to actually get to Antarctica. It, there were two groups of people, right? One that was very like the leader just uh, made everybody work super hard when it was good weather. And then they would hunker down when it's bad weather. Right. And the other group, whether it's good or bad, it didn't matter. They would always go this distance and that's it. Right. And who do you think got to the Antarctica first? Right. The people that were consistent and just did their thing. And then that's it. They wouldn't keep pushing it, even if it was a good day. And one of the most special, important parts about the story was towards the end when they could see Antarctica, they could see it there in the distance. They made their distance and then the leader said, all right, you see it, you're excited, we're stopping. We're gonna <laughs> wait till tomorrow, right? And there's something really special about that. And the other group, I believe they died. So just, oh, you know, God. like they, they got to Antarctica and they couldn't get back or something like that. <laughs> Wait, this is recent or or no, no. This is a a story I recently uh, <laughs> discovered, right, for myself that happened a long time ago. I'm just like, all right, everybody, so go consistent, little by little, with your heart, or you die. <laughs> yeah, in the extreme situations, perhaps you know, perhaps you got to know if you're in a sprint or a marathon. Yeah, it's a good story, Bobby. It's <laughs> great. Damn the consequence, though. <laughs> Why don't we go on to another? Um, which one did we do? We we did a microphone one last. So this one comes from Ray. Ray asks, any tips for balancing self teaching as a university student? Mm, you know what? That one. I don't know if that one kind of pertains to us. Does anybody have anything quick they want to mention with that? Maybe the university teacher there. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I, I've been in that situation, right, where you're 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 having to do certain amounts of uh, work for your classes, but you feel like your focus is kind of outside of the things you're having to do at that moment. And I, I actually think the answer is really similar to what we gave um, during the Jesse's earlier question about like you know the nine to five job versus the other thing. You treat your university as your nine to five job, and then you make sure that on the side you're you're prioritizing the other types of learnings and things you want to focus on? I think also um, 
because I didn't go to a fancy art school. I actually went to a really awful art college. <laughs> and well, one, tell us which one. No, I'm kidding. Oh, no, it, it shut down. So it's fine. <laughs> oh, art, is, art Institute of Fort Lauderdale. They used to be like McDonald's of like <laughs> art schools. <laughs> <laughs> the government has like a whole like issue with them they've they've been lawsuits so, so not great not great and I remember being there as a student and being like wow I you know there's a couple teachers that really tried and they really made a difference in my life but the administration and the way that that school run or ran it just wasn't giving me the tools I needed and that I knew I needed to be able to do the things I wanted to do for a living so I think it's having a very honest conversation with yourself it's like okay is your school like you know mine was really bad you know um is your school teaching you the things that you know that you'll need if the answer is yes then then give that you know you're all like you know really really take this time to study time to study is a mar marvelous thing we don't get enough of it if the answer is maybe you know like really address which which teachers are really good and are making a difference you know stick with them hey sam what's up what are you doing you probably have an awesome teacher here <laughs> I would take a class with you. But anyway, uh, <laughs> well, on schoolism, that's the other thing, too. Um, but the other thing were, it was my conclusion was that my school didn't teach me what I wanted to. And if I'd gone that, that path, I wouldn't have learned the things I needed to. So I started, you know, kind of researching, okay, I'm not getting what I need. What is it that I need? And even answering that question will yield to you many different kind of results. Um, like, for example, for me, it was, you know, this was before social media, before, I don't even know if schoolism was, was the thing. This is like early 2007, around there, 2000. Yeah, it just started schoolism. Was, yeah. Yeah, I think schoolism was like 2006. Yeah. Yeah, it was, then I, 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 I wish, <laughs> but like, I, I just went online and I would go to workshops and I'd like really, really try my best and, you know, to learn what I needed. And then when a school opened up, that was exactly what I needed, which was the atelier for me. I kind of up and left. I didn't even graduate. <laughs> like, because I realized like, you know, this is especially out here in the United States, like this is costing me an arm and a leg. I'm not getting what I need. Um, and so I dropped out. And, you know, it's not something that I recommend for everybody, though, because like having a degree can be really helpful for certain things. For example, if you want to teach at a universal leader level, that's really important. Or if you want to, you know, travel and live in other places in the, in the world, they do require, um, you know, documentation. But it's just one of those things where it's just like, you know, be really honest and, you know, the, the ones that are teaching you, the ones that you feel are giving you what you need, stick really close to them. Um, and if not, like, don't be afraid to seek what you need. I took that to the max, actually, when I was in school. So this is some advice that might be bad, but I thought it was good because <laughs> I, I would pretty much do the bare minimum for the classes that I didn't really care about or felt like they they aligned with my goal right and the ones that I really cared about I went to all the time I went to you know attend the lecture again in another person's class and you know things like that so my report card was nothing but A's and D's you know it's so funny there was a complete like difference there in fact I forgot about a class you know, I had a computer history class and then they start to talk about um, how many hairs were on Sully from Monsters, Inc. And I left. I never came back for months <laughs> until one day I, I finished the class and then I see everybody walking one direction. And I, I was walking the other direction. I, I was like, where are you guys going? And they're like, computer history. And I was like, oh, shit, I still. Yeah, I, I'm in that class, I think. <laughs> and I went to the class and the guy was like, oh. Yeah, I, I think I remember you or whatever. I'm like, listen, you know, uh, this is the situation. And I literally forgot about this class. And what can I do to pass? I just need to pass, you know? And yeah, so not the best advice, but maybe it was really good advice because I, I got a lot better at the things I concentrate on. Uh, one thing about that, I think like... I, I think this is all really great advice. And like, you should, you should be focusing on the things that... Um, 
are kind of aligning with your goals but i also think it's important to know that like you don't really know what your future self is going to need yet right and so there there are skills that are going to be important to you and it I don't think this necessarily means like go ahead and focus on everything, right? So, so follow the advice that's been given so far. However, um, you know, it's like the schoolism class that I'm teaching right now on lighting and surface. It's like that came from classes that were not re related to my goals, right? It was my physics classes, um, and uh, you know, 3D rendering classes, neither of which I really use anymore. And it's just like you. You just might be surprised at the the ways that like different bits of knowledge will affect you. The the thing, just because I think that advice could possibly stress people out, That's is true. just to, to focus on the idea that like you are always self learning, right? Mm -hmm. Your university is just one stage of your life, and like if you miss an opportunity because you're focusing on the wrong thing, that's totally fine. You can reorient yourself later, but just be open to the fact that like really valuable knowledge could come from anywhere, and so you're always kind of your eyes are on the swivel for like where's that little golden nugget of information that I could pull in that can become kind of now part of my future self because I've seen it again and again you know it's like everybody's just trying to get through high or trying to get through um, their college degree and, and get into the industry right now uh, you know there's so many people that are kind of in that boat but like you know 10 15 years from now you're going to be directing a film or something like that and now suddenly that arcane little bit of knowledge over off on the side becomes essential and you know it, it's so just be always learning, right? The, the self-learning thing is really important. Don't give it up. I just learned arcane's an actual word, not just a cool show. <laughs> uh, Maureen, probably good, the great best advice. student out of here, graduated from Stanford. Do you have any advice on like on this? I didn't. I, I was like too busy clicking on like answer live to actually have read the question. Okay, but it seems to be about school. <laughs> How to optimize for school? How to still learn, um, you know, outside of school while still. Oh, okay, okay. I loved Carla's idea because, uh, for me, it's not like we can always say like let's add something else on top of stuff, and I like to just force the existing place that I'm at to accommodate my needs. So, so what you're saying, Carla, like Kabam, I think you said it was Kabam having that lunch hour, like I would put together a group of people. So then it becomes a thing and embedded. And then mm -hmm. your like bosses will love it too, because they're like, oh, look, they're a leader. And look, the morale is so high because they're like <laughs> doing this together. But actually forming something where you're um, doing it together as group pressure, but also then you end up talking during that time and like bonding with each other. So it also helps you with work and your bosses like it because they think that it makes you happier, et cetera. And maybe at that point, if you want to like take classes, you could even start saying, well, 10 of us are doing this. Can you chip in some money to hire a teacher to come in or like do schools or, or something? And then there's pressure because then you have a group of people mm -hmm. to do it too. Because <laughs> then they don't want to have to say no to all these people for morale reasons. So I'm a huge proponent of that. Um, and then just a quick tip about school. I think it is all about getting to know your teachers really well. So these teachers have crazy connections within industry. And um, like for now, whenever we're looking for artists, I still going to the same people from all the schools and asking them for recommendations. And if they're remembering you, they'll recommend you. So um, even way after, um, also, when I'm looking for people, they send it out to their alumni networks, right, whenever there's opening and jobs. So um, they're usually a great resource, um, especially if you're asking them for real life advice, too. Like, hey, can you help me figure out which which jobs to apply for and whatnot? And they, like, figured it all out for me for all schools, both like business school and also undergrad. They they are still helping me to this day when I need anything I need, or like I need to keep up to date on like research and something. I send an email like, hey, what's the latest? So that's just uh, something you should definitely do. And in, in fact, you'd be like, can I help you on the side on anything you're doing? Can I do a little, like side project with you? Whatever it takes to get closer to the teachers. Mm -hmm. I'm just realizing how functional the schools both Maureen and Sam are from. <laughs> <laughs> Mine shut down, so like we can talk bad about it, but oh man, <laughs> it makes a difference. <laughs> While we go to a live question, Alexandra, you have the mic. Hi, 
Hi, thank you, uh, Bobby. Um, yeah, my question is probably a little different. Um, you know, I want more than anything to be able to make my living as an artist, and I've been working at it for years, but I don't. So I have, you know, two jobs. I fitness train on Zoom, and I am a marketing person for a small business. And I don't really have enough time to work on my art that I would like to. And so when I do a free time, like that's really all I want to do because I'm so unhappy. I don't get to spend more of my time doing it. And so, you know, the thing is then it's like, because there are so many limited hours in the day, like I don't have as much time to, to leave my house and to go do things that I'd also like to do and see my friends. And particularly with the pandemic, like I feel like I've sort of lost track with a lot of people. Um, and so then it becomes this thing of like, I, I don't want to go out and do things because I want to spend that time working on my projects. But if I don't do those things, like I'm not like I'm not being social, which is necessary for, you know, the human spirit. And I'm not getting out into nature also necessary for the human spirit. So I don't really know how to like bridge that gap and still try to reach my goals of, you know, being in all of your shoes, <laughs> being able to make a living as an artist. Oh my gosh. You know, can I just say, I really connect with that, like uh, not enough time to be social. Um, <laughs> I swear if I like, skinned myself you would just see robot parts underneath because that's how I feel like I am I'm just like I don't you know I just do my work and so I actually because I'm so robotic I have reminders that I put onto my phone um, once a week a new friend would pop up on my phone and you know call up so and so you know reach out to so and so because I'm such a robot and I have this set to annually that might help. That's great. Amazing. That's amazing. That's great. Um, I, I, every single time I, this is TMI, but every time I go to the bathroom, that's my time to call a friend. <laughs> so then you know you got to do it and you have nothing else to do during that time. So I guess you could do other things, but I know that's fully TMI. Not audio, but you know, right? Do, do, you have, I hope. do you flush after you hang up so that a person no, I do like, they, uh, they all know, they expect, they're like, are you on the, bathroom i'm like yeah i'm like what's the big deal everyone pees right everybody so, so it's not like a secret so i like don't understand why it's such a big deal so they're they expect the it and anything it makes them feel really close to you because they feel like you're being vulnerable but yeah. i'm like no i do this with everyone. but it totally works so good that's oh awesome. my god oh um, never yeah. tell me if that's you so are <laughs> I would I, immediately I smell it. I would immediately, like, I almost imaginary smell it right now. Oh, no. Very visual sharing. people here. Uh, yeah. Everyone does it. I don't understand. Why it's such a big deal. It's, so good. it's like talking while you're eating. It's, it's a great like, idea. Everyone knows you're eating. But um, by the way, to answer your question about um, like social, like what I, I did in the past, again, I'm no longer an artist, I wish I was, but um, what I used to do is I find somebody who is also at the same stage that I'm at, who is also mm -hmm. trying to become an artist or live out the dreams. And then we would, in this case, he was a musician and we made a pact with each other that all each of us would send each other the, like the, for me, it would be drawing. And for him, it would be music that he wrote that day at the end of every single day. And this is a way that we kept each other accountable. It was really great. It was great in all aspects of my life. It, it started bleeding over because I was like a UI designer at the time. It would help me be a better UI designer because I was so happy. Um, and it just made me think in a different way, but it kept it so that I have social pressure actually to consistently do it. But it also when we start talking to each other, we started dating, of course, but when we start talking to each other, because we have this like shared bond. But when we start talking to each other about it, it was like a release of like, it's like our secret moment, but also like a way to bond and talk about the art that we created. And that worked out really well for me. I yeah. love that accountability part. Yeah. Just yeah. just riffing off of that idea. I think um, I just want to advocate for service. It's like service is something that you can schedule, right? Or it's something you can do just on your own, right? But like find somebody that you can be generous to or that you can help out somewhere uh, there's so many options and, and opportunities for that and it, it could even just be um like maureen is talking about making a connection with somebody else in the industry you're helping up an up-and-coming student or or something like that but like there is something 
like I, I think part of what you're what this question is getting to is that feeling of what the heck am I doing with my life, right? That's what this question is really all about. And like serving people will help you feel like, okay, I think I know what I'm doing with my life. To, to add different, you know, different kind of thoughts onto this as well. Um, and I so totally agree with Sam and Maureen, like the idea of service, the idea of finding what is, a, you know, it's cheesy to say, but finding a tribe of people, you know, that enjoy the thing and are on the same level and are on the same kind of place in the journey that will help you a lot. I think it's also understanding that you're at one stage of your life where you, for financial reasons, for whatever reason, this is where you find yourself, where you're, you're working two jobs. You're trying to make it really hard just to make a living, but you want to go somewhere else. Number one, really tell yourself and internalize that where you are right now in life isn't where you're going to be for the rest of your life. Cause I think that can be very scary for people when you're finding yourself in like a space where you're like, is this, is this going to be it? Like it can be scary, but it's not. Um, because I think like, you know, some of the stuff that we talked about earlier about prioritizing, you know, you have your fitness Zoom classes, you have your marketing job in between the quiet times, you can always like, break out a sketchbook and, you know, do a quick sketch, do a little study, decide, okay, you know what, this week, uh, I'm going to study the arm and you're already in fitness. So like, you should know anatomy real good. Uh, <laughs> so like this week, I'm going to study the arm or as I'm doing, you know, my calls or something like that, there's a little lull in time and space. I'm just going to do a study from life. Sometimes it's not also about like drawing. Sometimes it's about thinking too. So strategizing, let's say you're walking down the street and you see something really beautiful and you say to yourself, damn, I really want to paint that. You can just think about painting it. Like think about the technical steps that like will take you there. There's a super interesting, everybody knows the whole 10,000 hour myth, you know, idea. Well, number one, the, the person who wrote the 10,000 hour thing misquote the researchers <laughs> to, to do like a super fancy little tagline, like, hey, 10,000 hours, solid package, yeah. Um, but what the research actually showed was that it didn't matter. Quantity time did not matter. What mattered was quality and the intent that you put into your practice. And they found that some of the best violinists in the world, like not only are like, they practice like maybe four, three hours a day, like, and, but the thing that they did constantly is practice with intent and think about how to play, you know, basically like the violin. So I think you'll find yourself improving so much better if you let go the anxiety Accept that, you know, you're in a tough spot right now where you don't want to be, but that's not forever. And start kind of seeking your, you know, seeking service, seeking your tribe, but start strategizing in your mind and making the most out of your little time. And I think like little by little, you'll get to where you want to go. Yeah. Also, uh, like to add to that, expectations can determine like if you're going to fail or succeed a lot of times if you're expecting things to happen very slowly and you're still down to do it a lot of times that's that's the difference you know i i'm a, i like uh the whole entire idea of uh delayed reward you know when i eat sunflower seeds i just crack them all open i make a pile you know, like I'm that kind of person, right? So if you're okay with delayed rewards, it makes everything so much easier. But if you expect rewards to come right away, then you're going to fill that that road, that, that path that you're on with disappointment. Yeah. Oh, also to add on to everything too, when you say find your tribe, it doesn't need to be someone that's in your vicinity so it's always great to have an in-person person that shares your same loves um for me when i started out uh, my my group of friends that i would develop you know artistically with they were all online they were all in different parts of the world so like uh, joining any kind of forums of like you know activities painting activities something like that reaching out to that community and say hey i want to help and I want to be a part of this and I want to join in like that alone can give you 
you know, insane amounts of motivation that might, might, might help you through this. A big part of why I get up so early was because um, there was a point where I didn't like my job, mm -hmm. right? So I would wake up early because if I tried to do my own stuff after work, I didn't have that much energy. Mm -hmm. So I would wake up really early hours before I have to go to work and do some stuff for myself. Uh, and then the whole entire thing with getting a buddy, like Carla was saying, I think that's so that's so key. Like right now, one of my buddies is uh, Kay's mom. I call her in the morning. And I do stretches, right? Whether I like to or not, <laughs> you know, it really does help because I know <laughs> she's expecting me to call. Oh, that's so cute. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't we go to another question here? Um, Maureen, do you want to pick the next one? Or? Yeah. So Michelle, um, Michelle Ham, how do you know when you rested for too long? Sometimes I feel guilty when I'm unproductive. When you find yourself in the infinite scroll, <laughs> it's time to stop, get up, and do something else. When you're feeling guilty about resting too long. <laughs> Yeah, but for mm. some people that happens immediately. That's like yeah, two that's minutes true. in. That's true. Yeah. That one's a tough one. I don't know. Mm. I don't what's, really... what's... Yeah. I, I think the quality of rest is actually more important than the mm -hmm. time period of rest. Kind of like the, the quality of the work you're doing, right? Mm -hmm. That like that. you know, and that's that's why like the infinite scroll thing is just like, you know that's time to, to shut that thing down and go and you're in the infinite oh, God, scroll. Yes. And it's the same thing, I think, like there, there's a lot of activities that are rest activities that don't empower you, that don't rejuvenate you. And like, mm -hmm. just don't do those. There's other things you can do mm -hmm. that will rejuvenate you. So do that stuff, right? Yeah. It's like exercise is actually great rest. It's, it, it's counterintuitive. But if you want to rest, go exercise. That is so mm -hmm. good because mm -hmm. honestly, there's so many of us where our breaks, we're not taking a break at all. We're mm -hmm. stimulating our minds yeah. like constantly, maybe even faster because now you're looking through a whole bunch of stuff. You know, when, when I take breaks, there's, there's an objective there. It isn't just like, let go of everything. This is the objective is to take a break. Yeah. And this is how robotic I am. I also schedule in be spontaneous, you know, <laughs> on Saturday, be spontaneous somehow. Right. It's like put in that effort to do that thing well. Uh, yeah. It's the same with breaks. I like that. I'll get advice. <laughs> hey, several people have been asking throughout this time, what sort of books do you keep or do you, what books do you read? Ooh, that's a good question. Right now I'm reading this one that was uh, recommended by Sparth called Effortless. It's like, why i love this part okay uh so you know we we go good hard work carla right oh you you did a really great hard job there oh don't take the easy way out sam but then if we were to evolve with the with the goal of always trying to do things the hard way rather than the easy way <laughs> We wouldn't be really evolving that much. I love that <laughs> that thing in the book that says this. I was just like, wow, that is so funny. We're, yeah, you know, we're, I, I think there's some holes there, but in general, no, it no. sounds pretty awesome. Like, work yeah, smarter. we should try to work easier. Yeah, work smarter, not harder. <laughs> I read a book um, that actually pertains to this discussion really well. Uh, it's called Switch by Chip and Dan Heath. And it's about how you get uh, yourself or other people to change their behavior. Um, it's really interesting. And uh, I, I'd recommend it to people just because, like, there's there's a lot of great information and a lot of stuff to think about in terms of, like, okay, I, my life is this way. I want it to be this way. What types mm -hmm. of factors have to be in place in order for me to, to change over? Love it. Mm. I usually read um, – I have two books usually at hand, something fiction and then something nonfiction. Um, for the fiction, I'm on the 
Grisha trilogy, I think it's called, uh, but The King of Scars. It's like young adult and it's really pulpy, but I love it. I love that thing. I love it. It's fantasy. People are falling in love. It's beautiful. <laughs> but then I also switch out my, my books. Um, and I have a couple other books that I'm reading that are n- nonfiction. Um, one of them is uh, Never Split Difference. Uh, which is like a negotiation t- book, which is really interesting. It comes from like an FBI negotiator. And I always find books like that on like psychology, on like why do people, you know, how people negotiate, how people behave, body language, things like that. I always find really interesting. Anything to do with like, uh, you know, uh, just just different things. The other one that I'm reading right now is The Minimalist Entrepreneur because the person who wrote it is a friend of mine and he sent me a a actual like a really nice little copy of it to read it and it's been really good actually I it's it's written in a very like you know where the title is repeated many times but you see that in a lot of self-help books but it has a lot of really good ideas about like how to be an entrepreneur with less and that that I found really interesting you know it's not something that like I dive in but there's a couple little nuggets in there that I find interesting for art um I also have pending a sergeant uh a sergeant novel about Madame X the the lady that he painted and how scandalous that whole incident was because like she was the you know madame x is that painting of sergeant where she has like that very intense drop that he actually had to repaint because it was too intense and um too scandalous at the time and it ruined her uh because she was rumored to be you know kind of you know the the girl you go to um but it ruined for for you know good times <laughs> good times and for you know in modern in modern times you're just like who cares don't <laughs> shame but this is like victorian era you know mm-hmm. like um and apparently she uh her mother uh fought him uh almost they almost sued uh, her mother fought sergeant to change the title because the title was originally the lady's name and so he changed it to madame x and it was like it had to be it had, that painting was taken away from paris and the lady had to run away from paris it was just the drama drama victorian era drama so yeah what's the title of the book oh god i forgot uh <laughs> okay i have madame a x coffee. sergeant book. i think it is madame x i think it's just straight up madame x let me double check Maureen, you read any, a lot. Uh, I read lots I, of children's books. Uh, oh, like right. <laughs> of course. <laughs> no, but they're perfect for art too, because you're um, the one I'm reading right now. Like I actually read them even when I didn't have kids. Like children's books are my preferred oh, way awesome. because they're really short <laughs> and they're sweet and I like artwork. So it's yes. actually my preferred. But um, right now the book that we just got is called The Rabbit, The Rabbit and the Rabbit Listened. It's amazing. Like a lot of these books are about um, social emotional intelligence and it reminds you stuff about like even as an adult, like how to be a good human being (laughs) or how to calm down when you're upset. Like I watched Daniel Tiger's Neighborhood and Mr. Rogers all over again. And I literally think it's making me a better person and a better human being. So, but by the way, it's just straight up when I'm reading these books, um, I look at the artists and I figure out like which of them I like and whether or not I could reach out to them for them to actually do work um, with me. Like I, when I watched, um, when I recently read when, while mama had a quick little chat, mm-hmm. you all know, um, uh, Andrea Boy, Boye, <laughs> she also did oh, all the, yeah, yeah. yeah, she's amazing, but she also did all the, like, uh, and she persisted with, uh, Clinton, all those mm-hmm. books too. But I didn't realize that she had also done the previous. And I was like, this looks like it was made by someone who does animation because the curves, the line of action is super strong. (laughs) You can find a lot of amazing artists through children's books too. Yeah. And she started off in animation, right? And she started off at DreamWorks. uh, Married to Andrea Blasich, amazing sculptor. What a tag team. (laughs) It was also, what's that book? Extra Yarn. Um, he worked on, I think, Caroline. I forget his name, but it's uh, Extra Yarn is an amazing book about a kid who finds um, a box and inside it is rainbow yarn and everything else in their village is black and white. 
and she starts knitting things and she, they think that she's going to run out of yarn, but she never runs out of yarn. She keeps on do, creating things, coats for everybody until it's changed the entire town. She never runs out of yarn. And I think it's a metaphor for like love, right? <laughs> she doesn't run out of love. And then when a Duke comes and likes clothes and wants it, he steals it from her, but when he opens the box, it's empty. But it's about how all the naysayers within the town just keep on thinking that she's going to run out of yarn and you totally can't do it. And she's like, yes, I can. And it's a beautiful artwork. I highly recommend this book. That's a great okay, pitch. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send it. Yeah, to yeah, send the link. I'd love to see that. <laughs> you know, one I want to mention as well is uh, Bill Peet, an autobiography uh, by Bill Peet. I don't know if anybody, you know, when Maureen, when you're talking about children's books, I was thinking about that book, because even though that isn't really a children's book, it's put together like a children's book. It has pictures and it's really, it's a really easy read. And it's all about the amazing life of Bill Pete, story artist, uh, most notable for Dumbo, you know, like wow. uh, that, that scene holding the little baby with her trunk. Oh, just melts the heart. <laughs> Yeah, and Atomic Habits, I just want to mention that one. That was the one I was reading before, Effortless, and that was great. Um, Wouter Tulp uh, suggested that, so thanks, Wouter. Damn, we gave everybody lots of suggestions. <laughs> can I, can yeah. I suggest a question? Um, I'm just yeah. looking through the questions here, and I'm, I'm seeing one that I think might be applicable to a lot of people, which is, uh, um, it's Igor was was Nikki? I don't know if that's how you pronounce it, but he says, "How do you tell whether you're working too slow or your employer is asking too much?" I've experienced a lot of crunching this year, and while I know I'm at fault sometimes, I can't shake off the feeling that the studio I work for gives me deadlines that are just crazy. Mm. I, I feel like that's an important question that we should probably address. Yeah, especially with freelancers, we tend to overwork. We tend to do too many hours. Yeah. I think um, it's 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 hard to tell um, how fast anybody works or not without knowing them, but I think something that I can give is an estimate to what's acceptable in the industry. So maybe that might help you kind of gauge whether they're being unreasonable or whether you need to, you know, learn how to be faster. Um, I'm going to quote Marvel times and I want to say Marvel is very generous with their time in comparison to other companies. I know that, um, for example, when I worked at ILM, our deadlines were faster, but for Marvel, we usually take about maybe like one, one, one day to two days tops for some very detailed sketches. Like we're not talking about like quick little lines. We're talking about things that are 30% there, like where everything's figured out, all that's done is left to, you know, render. So we do take our time and think that through. And then depending on what it is, that's when we get extra time. Like for example, for a character, about a day to two days extra. So altogether, you can spend anywhere between three days to four days working on a character. For keyframes, which are large paintings, um, it really also depends. Like if it's like, a care, you know, a couple of characters, a background that we they usually give us about a week. But if it's like something that's like 20 characters, 50 things, blah, really huge, about a week and a half to two. Um, props are anywhere from like a day to two days. Um, portraits are about a day, you know, maybe even shorter if you're if you're if you know exactly what you're doing or or if there's not a lot of design process design process takes time um that's the thing that's trickiest like because you really have to think things how you know things work together um at ilm it was a lot faster though um but they also didn't expect uh well sometimes they did like when you know but but the work was a little bit more sketchier more you know faster um when they did want something highly rendered they would give adequate time so maybe that'll help kind of gauge where you're at that's great that's great info for anybody that wants to you know work at marvel or or do something <laughs> as like big time as carla <laughs> uh yeah anybody else want to mention something about you know, working too much or working too slow. 
So, Bobby, you talked a while back about uh, Chris Pern and just his exercises that he does to get faster. And I've done a lot of thinking about that because it seems like when it comes to work-life balance, like getting fast is going to be important, right? Because you can mm-hmm. you pull in the same amount of money, get the job done more quickly, or you know, if the company is asking for crunch time, you get your stuff done and just helps the whole project. Um, and I think it it does seem like it's a true thing that that speed is a skill, and it's a skill that you kind of have to practice. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think when I look back, it's like I, I'm kind of I'm not that fast of a designer or drawer, but I'm a, I'm a fast painter, and I think it, a lot of it just came from um, just kind of trying to attack the problem more and more quickly every time, uh, and and it seems worth it, it's an effort that's worth making, right? Even if you don't know whether your employer is being reasonable or not, that like from work life balance focus, that like putting some effort into trying to learn how to be faster is, is going to help you in a lot of ways. For some context, what Chris Pern said, and Chris Pern is the uh, director of the Willoughby's as well as um, Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs too. Uh, he is extremely fast, extreme. You know, we had like four or five different story artists together, some at Pixar, some at Netflix and blah, 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 blah. Uh, everybody's drawing storyboards for like this uh, fun little thing at Lightbox Expo. Um, by the time people were drawn, done drawing their black and white storyboards, Chris was already done and his were in color. You know, that's, and that's just naturally his speed. And what he would do is he would force himself to go faster than he's able to control and get a little sloppy. And he said that he just depended on his brain to figure it out and catch up you know, over time. And he just did that a bunch of times and got super crazy quick. I might want to add something just a little different as well. Um, And I think a lot of this advice, you know, there's no one singular advice that is applicable to everybody. Like everybody will be a little different. Um, Because I've also known people that are extremely fast, but then what they end up doing is they overwork themselves because they're just like fast and then they take too much. So when it's when it's that way you know i always like okay maybe it is a good idea to just slow down for a bit you know or not really slow down get the work done but don't take more more and more just because you you know all that stuff and and charge them the same just take breaks yeah yeah it's like this the speed is it's a tool in your belt right and you pull that tool out when you need it but it Mm -hmm. it doesn't it's not the thing that determines how your life goes right yeah and but but if you're but yeah but exactly but if you're slow then finding ways how to speed up the process will be really beneficial to you because then you can maneuver your time a lot better you can also like you know get more pay um or or not more pay but you just get more of your time and that's really valuable in all this so i think like my my perspective on it is just it's more of a balance thing like if you're too fast like don't let people know how fast you are so you can get some free time and charge them the same and have time to really think all these stuff out but if you're too slow find ways to be faster because it will come hand come in handy I think the instinct to impress people is really, really harmful, right? It's like we all have it and you just want so much. It's like if you're fast or if you're really, you know, good at your whatever it is, right? It's just like so easy to to think like, okay, I'm just going to blow these people's minds with what I'm doing. And like you can't you can't make that your main goal. Kind of going back mm-hmm. to the 60%, 70% thing <laughs> that Carla was talking about earlier. Well, just so- like don't, it's not about impressing people, right? Get the job done and then clock out. Yeah, I don't know. Oh. This is really quick. Yeah. The way that I see myself whenever I, I talk to a new client, I tell them I'm a koi fish. I will take up whatever, <laughs> however much deadline you gave me. And if you need something done in an hour, I know the tools and I know the technique well enough to get something to you in an hour. But if you give me three days, I will take those three days and like however done I get certain sections got done really quickly. Then that gives me time to think, then that gives me time to rest, and that gives me time to really work on it at a certain pace. So I that's that's just it's it's about meeting the client's need in some capacity, but also trying to find ways to to fit in that comfortably. I feel like we've been dancing around this a little bit, but um most likely I'd say like 90% chance you probably screwed up in the beginning, right? And this mm-hmm. goes for all of us when we're first meeting that freelance, you know, client, 
It's like, how long will this take you? Well, let me think. My absolute highest potential that I could do this in a day. And that's what you end up saying oh, yeah. instead of like three, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm sure, Maureen, you oh, probably have that so been when you're hiring people and it's like, oh, well, how long will this take you? Well, he, he said three days. Well, this mm -hmm. is the fourth day. What's going on? Yeah. I guess you got to plan for failure, too. <laughs> yeah, a lot of times. And you know what? Uh, Craig Mullins has told me so many amazing things. And one of the things that he said was like when he gives a, a quote for duration, he bakes in a day just to experiment right so it's like how long will this take you and he thinks six days he'll say seven mm -hmm. right because the seventh day he's just gonna mess around mm -hmm. that's, that's great so good that's quite good <laughs> anyhow we are you know time really flew by in yeah. this one and we are pretty much out of time i also want to mention if anybody wants to learn how to sketch faster wednesday i'll be doing a live life drawing session that everybody is uh you know welcome to join me on uh, my youtube channel and we'll sketch fast all all through the whole entire session how fast uh, yeah thank you how to our wonderful audience that has tuned in and um my amazing co-host Maureen and uh, our wonderful special guests, Sam and Carla. Thank you guys so much for tuning in and, and sharing your thoughts and your opinions and all great knowledge. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thank you for having us. <laughs>